My son was injured in a work accident in May of 2016 and they went about physical therapy and while he was doing the physical therapy for his back injury he was given narcotics, opioids, and when they finally realized that they had to do surgery on his back then he had the surgery and the day of the surgery I told the doctor I said he's addicted you need to do something so he said after the surgery we'll put him on pain management so this was the beginning of his five-year spiral he after he was weaned off the medication after he he had healed then he started buying pills on the street then when he realized that was an expensive prospect he turned to heroin and when that was not really doable he was injecting it he was getting abscesses then he would go into rehab so we did the yo-yo of back and forth rehab he began smoking heroin instead of injecting it and all the while he was what I would call a high functioning heroin addict he would shoot up or smoke before work during work after work and he was a commercial electrician so he was doing his job he was doing his thing he was doing side jobs and just doing enough drugs to keep him afloat in between bouts of recovery and he had he had some drug charges and he had been in jail for 45 days and he was released from jail and five days later he died from fentanyl It was one day after his 29th birthday. I spoke to him on his 29th birthday. He was getting ready to go to dinner with his dad in California. And I said, okay, well, I'll talk to you tomorrow. And he said, you know, love you. And he was going to the his typical restaurant he always went to on his birthday. And the next day I texted him, how did it go? And I, I was at work, so I didn't really think much of it. And that night, which was Mother's Day, early Mother's Day morning, I got a phone call from his dad and said that he was gone. We had just celebrated his sister's college graduation, but my son was in high school. He was an athlete. He was the offensive MVP in his freshman year, loved sports. He, he was very active, he was very funny. He had a lot of friends, and his dad and I, even though we were divorced, he would still come to our home. My, my husband, uh, I remarried many years ago, and he would come to our home for holidays. So it was, it was a pretty good co-parenting situation, and um, if we had an event at my parents' house, you know, he was still included. So there was, it was a very inclusive, warm family life. In hindsight, I've, I've, you know, just reached into my memory. And when he was a child, he would always get stomach aches. And, you know, I've, I've looked into that. His pediatrician could never find anything wrong. But looking back, I think perhaps those stomach aches as a child were some type of manifestation of anxiety that maybe later on was just undiagnosed and turned into self-medicating. I can't say we were blindsided by it just because of his substance use in the past, but of course nobody ever thinks it's going to happen to them. So in that sense, we probably were. But it's a phone call that you don't think you're ever going to get. You just don't, because it happens to other people. It doesn't happen to you. And you know, the, the three most ignorant words in, in the English language are not my kid. And it was my kid. By the time his body was found, he had he had been deceased for a while, and uh, his dad had tried to do CPR anyway, even though there was obvious signs of decomposition because he had he was sitting in a chair and he had fallen and onto his knees, and then his face had was on the floor, and um, so one side of his face was just black and when his dad who was in shock was describing to me 
what it, what he witnessed, he said, I, I think there was an explosion because his face was black. And again, he was still in shock. He wasn't putting two and two together. And he said that he scooped vomit out of his mouth and did CPR and scooped more vomit and did CPR. And, you know, of course he doesn't care because that's what a parent is going to do. And uh, he did CPR until the paramedics got there. And I'm sure they took one look at him and knew. But they still, out of kindness, they put the paddles on him and, you know, tried. And, um, of course, to no avail because that, you know, he was, he was clearly gone at that point. Of course, we all wish that there's something that we could have done to, to stop it or prevent it or change it or rewind or something. And it's just, we can't. All we can do is make other people aware of it and let them know what's out there and, and it's coming for your kids. One of the things that I, I like to bring up in all this is when these kids are dying, the people rally around the parents and, oh my gosh, you've lost your child. But siblings are the forgotten grievers. And there's, there's just something, there's something extraordinarily painful watching a sibling grieve. I mean, it, my other child grieve over a lost sibling that she was extremely close to. She's, she's an only child now. There's just flat out not enough awareness. And I don't have an answer as to why. I don't know why every night on the news we would have a COVID headcount of how many deaths there were and why we don't have a fentanyl count every night on the nightly news. It, it's just unconscionable to me that we're not making people aware. And I realize that it, it's, it's such a huge problem trying to get ahead of it. We, we may not be able to get ahead of it. It may be too far out there but we can at least, at least let people know that it's there, that it's coming. You know, people don't know what they don't know. Kids don't know what they don't know. And that's why we're dying. That's why our kids are dying and our siblings and our parents, why, that's why they're dying. <laughs>